as is uncut, we're encouraging our student athletes to separate from being the athlete mm -hmm. and be the person. And even our morning practices have done that so much because our guys now can be more involved in activities in the afternoon and they can be students at night and they can go to a movie and they can do things that traditionally football players haven't ever been able to do. Talk about you know, what you look for when you're out trying to find student athletes that have the character that fit your program and fit this university. You've got one of the best recruiting classes in the country, so. Starting with me, wow. Ladies first. <laughs> the uh, ladies first, with beauty before brawn. You yes, can say. no yeah. question. <laughs> um, you know, I think recruiting is, you know, there's two types of coaches in our game, right? Those that can recruit and those that get fired, right? And then there's also two types of coaches in the business too, those that are happy and those that aren't. And the ones that are happy have recruited well and have really good people. Um, and uh, due to the NCAA rules, we spend so much time talking to these kids. You know, you just, you know them when the time they're, you've been in their home, they've been on your campus. You talk to them. You talk to their parents. You talk to their coaches. You've, um, there's really, it's really hard to have a, uh, to have anything unknown about these kids on the way in. And um, the things that matter to me are, have they demonstrated competitiveness? Is there a true love for the game? That that they, you can tell through. Do they watch it? Do they care about it? Do they talk about it? Um, and then, as you get to know them, do they do they sound as if they have interests in regards to? Um, the campus community that they're going to offer something, right? And then, then they're going to are they going to contribute in a way to the, the culture and the ethos of our program, which should mirror the institution in a way. Which is why we're all picky about where we work, um, you know. And then it's also the fit. I think we have to we can't understate how important it is to recruit the right fit to the institution, but also the right fit to your program and how they fit together. So once you get one, that affects who the next one is and who the next one is and who the next one is. Um, and uh, yeah, so I feel really excited about the class, and I know you were very helpful, and both of you, and I appreciate it. Well, uh, actually, uh, I have to go in the uh, exact opposite direction. We are recruiting kids that are so young, we don't really know that much about them. Uh, here's what we know. We know they can play. And so what we're hoping is by the time they, they, they get here that uh, they will check all the character boxes. Uh, but for us, it's a bit of a gamble. And, of course, I learned this the hard way by uh, not offering to an elite player uh, as soon as I could, and then all of a sudden, we're losing these kids to the teams we compete against. And so unfortunately for us, uh, we don't know that much about their character until they finally get here. And then our challenge obviously is to see if we can get them to fit uh, within our uh, character scheme, uh, but also to see if we can develop character. So for us, uh, we talk about you know living on a never ending ascension and the never ending ascension involves character development as a priority. Uh, their academic platform is a second priority. And then finally, uh, uh, their soccer revolution. And I loved uh, some of the things you just shared, Courtney, because I'm just spot on with you. In a player conference, we talk about basically self-discipline, competitive fire, self-belief, love of the ball, love of watching the game, love of playing the game, grit and coachability. And we actually assess them in those eight categories to see if uh, they are progressing towards where they want to go. And it's a self-evaluation. Even though I'm sitting there with them, we want them to assess themselves in this narrative they have and we want their personal narrative to be as close to the truth as possible but for me i would love to pretend that uh, we have figured out a way to measure their character before we actually get a commitment from them uh and uh, uh we just can't we can't wait that long we watch them play and all of a sudden if we don't offer duke's going to offer stanford's going to offer ucla's going to offer virginia's going to offer florida state's going to offer and all of a sudden we've lost them because i don't know how it works with you guys but if we don't offer immediately We've told them uh, you're in a whole pool of kids that we're not really interested in and maybe we'll develop an interest in you. And even though eventually we do develop an interest, offer the full scholarship, we weren't on board immediately and then we've lost them. So uh, for us, uh, we, we gamble a bit. We've got a little bit of your issue in that we're recruiting 15, 16 and 17 year olds. And foolishly, I'll say for a 22 athlete, What's his grades? I said, they have none. <laughs> I mean, he's, been, he's been in high school a semester. He's been <laughs> totally. two semesters. So we an don't know. What about his test an scores? <laughs> he, he, he's got none. Um, so what, what we've done is, is, number one, look at the ability. Because if he doesn't have the ability to win all of our games, then we shouldn't be talking to him. It's a waste of our university money. Mm -hmm. And then you go to academics. Because when the guys come to me and say, well, you watch this guy on video, I say, do you have a transcript? I don't want to watch him until I see a transcript because I'm watching a different person after I know more about him. 
and then I want to know about his family. It doesn't have to be two parents, but it needs to be a good one. And who's involved? Who's, who's leading the family? And it needs to be somebody you trust and you like, because you recruit them too. You're, you're signing whoever's attached, as we know, when, when you get there. And, um, and then they need to like the game, like mm -hmm. you said. They need to compete, because it's, it's hard. In my five years in TV, I, I got really disgusted watching teams that didn't try. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. And you, they think they're trying. And they're not trying, and you're sitting there, and, and each of our players is a reflection of us. Yeah. We're a reflection of Bubba. Yeah. So, I mean, how can we ask Bubba to give us the funds needed to have a program, and then we have a full house, and they don't try? And, and we only have 12 guaranteed games, and if they don't try in three of those, yeah. I mean, it, it makes no sense to me. So, the, so be competitive, like to play, like to practice. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I, I, I learned is I, I don't want to recruit them unless after I get to know them, I'd let them babysit my children or my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. If I can't trust them that much in my own house, they shouldn't be on our team. And, and then the last thing, I was sitting in, in, in Kenan Stadium with Coach Bo Beckler, who's a Hall of Fame coach from Michigan in the mid-90s, and I said, how do you decide who to take? Evaluation is, it, it determines whether we make it or not. Totally. We get the right kids, we got a chance. We don't, we, we all know, we've coached bad players and they play bad. <laughs> so we, we need to coach good players and coach them up. Yeah, totally. And he said, uh, that's easy. I said, but if you got 12 left and you're recruited, you can only take four of them. How do you decide which four to take? And coach said, it's easy. He said, they're all good enough, or you wouldn't have the 12 left for the four. They're all academically sound, or you wouldn't be looking at the fit. He said, take the ones you like. If you like them, they're going to like you. You know, I'd take that a step further and say, I tell my staff to, that same, the same thing about that final decision is, who can you lose with? Same thing when you're hiring yeah. staff, right? If you're going to walk down that hall after you gave it what you got, yeah. and you lost, if you can lose with them, you won't lose very often. Right, uh, yeah, can yeah. I can win with anybody. <laughs> I'm happy to yeah. win with anybody. Yeah, give me your um, best. Give yeah. me all you've got. If, if all you got's not good enough, we'll ask Bubba to schedule somebody else. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, that's it. But, but kids, give me, you can, give me kids all you can got. lose with. Do kids your you, job. Totally. Yeah, so you are bringing kids that you like. You're bringing kids that you think can play. Mm -hmm. Well, you kind of you, know that. That's one thing yeah, I do you know. Yeah, you do know <laughs> that. Yeah, the skill level. Although I, I think it's probably it, it's later developing in football because I think your kids are specializing quite early. These kids are just continuing to grow. But I do think that in addition to that skill level you see, we're trying to develop them socially, morally, ethically, academically. How do you, what do you do in your programs to really draw that out of kids and really inspire them um, for, for having a great life? I know you really talk about core values a lot and you're never, your life of, of ascension. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I'm one of these guys that just uh, reads books all the time. So for me, uh, I was obviously into business books really early, and they always talk about creating a culture, creating a culture of core values. And so what I started with is all these insipid cliches as our core values. You know, we work hard or something, and there was nothing inspirational about the sort of things I assembled. And I'm looking at, you know, the effect we're having on our culture with these more or less cliches, and I'm thinking, none of this is working. And all of a sudden, uh, I pick up uh, New York Times Magazine, and uh, this woman that studied Russian literature at Columbia um, talks about this Russian exile poet that was hired to teach the PhD candidates by the name of Joseph Brodsky. And he comes in, and this is the PhD candidate herself talking about being introduced to Brodsky. And Brodsky comes into Columbia and says, okay, all of my PhD candidates, you guys are gonna memorize reams of Russian poetry and Russian literature. And of course she was insulted as the rest of her colleagues were and they developed this cabal, got together and stormed into uh, Professor Brodsky's office and said, I'm sorry that uh, I don't think you understand. This is an elite American institution. We're not gonna memorize poetry and literature like an elementary school child. We're at a much higher level and we expect to be treated appropriately. And Brodsky said, well, if you don't memorize anything, none of you guys get your PhD. So with tails between their legs, they left the room and decided to memorize all this stuff. She said it was transformational. She said for the first time in her life, she felt what it was like to live in Russia. Their conversations were about these things they memorized. Her cerebral fabric, she thinks, changed because of what she memorized. So I'm thinking, okay, 
Nothing I've done with my program has worked in terms of these core values. We're gonna memorize motivational quotations attached to our core value, and now we do. So we don't believe in whining, which by the way, I think is one of the most destructive forces in athletics. So, which is your number one core value, and that's my all-time correct. favorite, yeah. no whining. <laughs> correct, it's also you know the rule of the Dorrance home, no one was allowed to whine. I said, you know, we actually had a dinner meeting one night with my kids once they all reached the age of reason. I said, I don't care if you guys are arsonists and murderers, but the one thing we will not tolerate in this family are whiners. <laughs> so I set the table, you know, <laughs> I set it perfectly for them when they were young. So same thing with our kids. Yeah, you're not allowed to whine. So they all memorize, be a force of fortune instead of a feverish, selfish little cloud of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. So every kid has memorized that. So if we hear anyone whining, they've got to recite it in front of the entire team because we just don't put up with it. So we have 13 of those. And the qu quotes actually have been developed by my leaders because they want to have this kind of culture. And honestly, Bubba, I am absolutely genuine. I think there are two things that distinguish our program. One is the competitive cauldron because these, these young women fight. And the other one is the core values. And I think those are the two most critical elements uh, that have shaped our culture in the most positive way. How about you, how do you shape culture within your programs? I think one of the ways we're pretty, since getting this job and being here, is that finding other people in their zone of genius and in their source of inspiration is really inspiring, right? And so I had asked our players when I first got here, like, what's one campus goal or what's, cam what's one campus cross-section that you, was it an improv show or, a, or is it an acapella sing or is it, what is it? And there are so many talented people on this campus. It allows you to have a sense of gratitude and a sense of place that then makes what you're doing more meaningful and less selfish oriented, right? Um, and as a result, we hope that they'll then come. So the expectation is they would go to soccer and football because that's their, this is their zone of genius and their source of inspiration. Um, and watching our players even in just nine months come outside of themselves and, and walk outside of, of the basketball identity um, is giving them a more, it's giving them a more, it's on, they're on a platform of gratitude for the institution and I think they're at a better source of inspiration about their impact on it because they know that they're surrounded by others. Um, so I think that's really critical. We talk a lot about being a good teammate um, and I had to be really intentional about what that means. Um, and I think that you have to lead it, you have to show it, you have to talk about it, you have to celebrate it um, and you have to punish it. And uh, you know, whether it's you know, huddling up after free throws, it's kind of what you said, Mac, I just, it bothers me when the, the things that you can control, you don't control, it really bothers me, right? And so we had to talk about what a good teammate looks like when you come on and off the floor and, and when you look at your coach in the eye and, and doing those things is allowing them to feel like it's more theirs. And um, people will always play harder for each other than they will for you. Um, so we talk about being a good teammate, we talk about engaging um, in other people's source of inspiration and, and, and zone of genius. Um, and we talk about just the value of compete out loud Tell everybody what your goals are, and then go for it. And I would rather be disappointed than frustrated. And if you don't reach your goals, I'm disappointed. If you don't try, I'm frustrated. And so I, I want to be very clear, this program is going to get to the Final Four, and, I'm, and I want everybody who comes here to wear this jersey, that is their goal. And they need to say it out loud, and we need to do it. That's great. Uh, these two are much smarter than I am. <laughs> So it's it's just sitting here listening to them. I need them to come and talk to our team. But, Start taking notes. You know, some of our guys might not understand it. But, uh, um, I think our deal in just sitting here listening is that uh, we're just totally transparent. We want everybody to understand how we all feel. And we're in a society now with so many things that are taboo. We can't talk about this. I'm afraid we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. And um, uh, that's a little sensitive. That we have nothing in our room that we don't discuss. And usually if it's the elephant in the room, we bring it up. Is that all the guys uh, every, together? The whole team and staff and coaches, all of them. So there is absolutely nothing off the board. And sometimes we'll just open it up and say, okay, who got something they're bothered with? Because Coach Dooley taught me what you just said, but he didn't say it quite as eloquent. Coach Dooley said, don't bitch transfer. <laughs> when he was the coach here before, and he was a great coach and a good person, but he'd say, I just tell my players, don't bitch transfer. You do what I tell you to do. <laughs> well, in a way, it's don't same want. Way. Sure. It's the yeah. same thing, but uh, now we tell them, um, we're gonna do what's right, so if you don't understand it and you're mad about it, come and talk to us. 
I don't want you talking to guys that can't answer it for you. I can answer it. So here's my number. Come well, ask me. Well, Mac, I got to share this with you because uh, you've impacted me in all kinds of ways. But one of my favorite events while I was growing up to be a coach was uh, being your warm up band. I don't know if you remember these days, but uh, I would be the warm up band. Then uh, uh, you would speak, and then Dean would speak. So that was the progression. Well, there were 75 for you and I, and four for <laughs> Coach Smith. So <laughs> it wasn't. We were the warm up band okay, for him. Well, so. I want you to know I would sit there in awe of listening to you galvanize the room. And I learned a lot about public speaking just listening to you speak because you're an evangelist. You get up there and you pull everyone in the room into your conversation. And this is, you know, post, uh, I don't know, two and 10 seasons or whatever it was. And you yeah, would get up, okay, was. yeah. Unimportant. But, but what was hilarious is you would point to this guy in the front row and he said, you know, you know, uh, Charles, I remember getting your letter and you would just humiliate him with the criticism he gave you in that letter. This of course after you, you took us into the top five in the country. <laughs> and you're pointing at all these people in the room that blew you up in a letter. And all of a sudden they're kind of grinning and smiling, but they're thinking, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And I just learned a lot watching you master the room. And so please, um, understand how much all of us uh, have appreciated you coming back, but also what I learned by being your warm-up band and listening to you basically recruit the room. Well, so uh, I learned a lot. I learned well, a lot. along those lines, I can say that too. I think when you talk about uh, you trying to bring your kids along, you also use examples instead of just talk at them, right? And so I remember when I was struggling with something, I asked Mac, hey, do you have a, if you ever you have a few minutes? And literally he said, how about lunch today? Right, and then we had lost. Maybe we lost a game or two, and uh, you had said, "Hey, let's go have lunch." Right, and um, I couldn't do it because I was recruiting. That's, that's why we lost. Um, and you, uh, and I, I told my team in those moments. So today, boy, I reached out to our football coach and asked to say I needed something, and he was available to me today. Hey, we just lost our second game in a row, and you know the soccer coach just asked me to have lunch, so that they see this is how you are a good teammate not just be a good teammate, right? Um, and so I think as educators, that's part of it, is showing the world that we live in. And like you're saying, you have open dialogue about this is what's happening. So have you, has anyone else, have you ever told any of your teammates in this room what you're really grateful that what they've done for our program, what we've lost, you know, we lost two in a row, where did, did you tell, anyone tell Anson what he did well? You know, that, those type of things, you know, using examples on the day to day so that they can, you can help guide them on how. Courtney, one of the best things we did was we asked our guys to tell their story. Because I could tell in preseason, we didn't know each other. And everybody, there wasn't a lot of trust in the room. There couldn't be any respect yet because they really didn't, we didn't know each other. And we weren't talking. You got to learn to talk. And young guys don't talk. So we, we couldn't get them to talk to us. And uh, how's your day? Fine. <laughs> so what's going on in your life? Not much. <laughs> it's good. What did you do yesterday? Nothing. <laughs> so I, I said, this didn't work. Right. So we, we said, let's everybody tell their story. Yeah. So I was the moderator, and we got up, and I said, Bubba, where, where are you from? Tell me about your family. How were you raised? What's the best thing that ever happened to you? What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? How did you manage it? Um, what's really unique about you that we don't know? Let's, let's get out of football. Let's get out of school. Tell us something about you that's really cool. And, and then we said, if you, if you could take somebody with you to an island or to dinner, who would you take? Who, who would you like to have three hours with to do that? And it was really unique to hear all the stories. And you're sitting there and, well, my dad's in prison and I was in a foster home. And totally. Said, and, and their teammates don't know it. No. Yeah, we did. They like, didn't even know yeah. each other. And we sure didn't know them. Right. And, and then I thought, and, and this is where it's, it's so unique for the, the, the four of us. And, I have no patience, and I know I have no patience, and sometimes that's not good. But if a young man calls me and, or texts me and says, uh, it's Friday, uh, I got something I need to talk to you about, are you in next week? I said, no, I'm in right now. Totally. I want to know now, I, I, don't, I don't do next week. Because I'll worry about him totally. for the entire weekend. I've got to do it now, I can't do that. If Bubba calls and says, can I see you uh, next Tuesday? No, what, what you got? <laughs> Come on, I don't, I don't want to, I'll fix it. What, what's, what's messed up? But we were sitting there the other day and I think this is where our lives are so unique and, and where we're, I think, even more fortunate than Bubba because we're right in the middle of their lives. Bubba has to be around 600, 800, 900, whatever it is, but we're day to day. And I sat there and I thought after hearing those stories, so many didn't have um, one of the two parents. 
So many of the guys didn't have a father. Prison, never met him, wasn't around. And I'm driving in one morning and I hear a country song from Kane Brown about my father. And he didn't have a father. And I'm going to be a better father than to my kids than my father was to me. And history repeats itself. Well, I guess that's up to me. And I'm sitting there looking at him one morning at 6.30 and I thought, you know, some of them just look sad. They, they've got this excuse that my father wasn't around, so I don't have to be tough. And I, don't, and I thought, you know, we got to get rid of that. We, we can't do that. So 68-year-old head coach plays a country music song <laughs> to 120 kids. And our strength coach, Brian Hess, who's 33, later told me, I thought you'd lost it. <laughs> I knew they weren't. That was the only up. time he said that, I'm yeah, sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> but that day. <laughs> the kids really got into it. And they didn't get into it because it was a country song. They didn't get into it because I said it. They got into it because the words were real to them. We were. And I said, don't let it be an excuse. You'll be a better dad because you didn't have one. And Mac, I thought that you created this chemistry because you were an exceptional dancer. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I come from a, a family of dancers. My Sorry. wife is a former pro, my eldest daughter. But I love watching those videos. <laughs> I watched one of them like 10 times in a row. I thought it was so, so extraordinary. I've and then I learned, from, I learned from <laughs> Courtney. Yeah. Mac, what have you done to me? She, yeah, well, let's see that. She's got the yeah. mood. But I learned from Courtney that what you're the doing mob. in the dance is you're touching every part of your body that hurts. Right. So <laughs> Courtney not, taught me that, that I'm that touching <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, so basically I thought this is cool. So Courtney knows about your dance stuff, and, and I love watching it, by the way. So oh, uh, I thought we'll that was keep cool. Keep winning, keep dancing. Yeah. But th yeah. this, is, this is part of our, our discussion, though. We, our, our telling our story was, was really tough. And I thought what I'd done is, is taken a room where we wanted information and we'd gotten a downer. We knew more about each other, but there's some hard stories. And, you know, you're saying, oh, wow, well, I'm going to coach him differently and all that. So at the end, I got so smart that I said, young Gray Bly needs to start a dance contest every day and we'll pick it up. So we'll start the meeting with a dance contest and have some fun and then they'll more likely be more honest and tell her story. So at the end, we get through, I've told my story, and everybody's danced, I haven't danced, and they said, Go. your turn. I said, I don't dance. And they said, no, everybody. You said, all inclusive. You said, we're all one, we Sally dance, you dance. He dance. <laughs> I, I even pulled the religious card. I even <laughs> said, I'm Church of Christ. They wouldn't let me dance. And they said, no, coach, you everybody gotta dance. dance. Well, I made a, a real, another mistake. I said, you beat South Carolina, which I didn't think they could. I'll dance. That's it. So we beat South Carolina. I've never been more excited in my life. I'm leaving the field. My sweet wife comes over and grabs my arm. She says, you need to get ready. I said, what? They're going to ask you to dance. I said, no, that was a month ago, man. I forget. I go in the dressing room. Not only is ESPN sitting in there waiting, they go, dance, dance, dance. And I'm thinking, OK. I'm 68, I'm four months off a knee replacement. I don't dance. And, and there's I have, no music. And I have no music. In our defense, there's no music. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. So. You guys are forgetting that. But you gotta have some fun. You gotta be who you are. And you, Mac, it was hilarious. I absolutely loved it. I'm not exaggerating. I watched it at least 10 times in a row. I thought it was so extraordinary because I was thinking if someone, because I don't dance either. With the people in my family, you shouldn't dance in front of them. It's just be a you know personal humiliation. So I'm thinking, <laughs> I kind of like what you did. Well, so I'm every young guy in there that. can dance, but me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But what yeah. you did is you opened yourself up. You lived out what you've been preaching to your team: communicate, uh, relate to people, develop a way that you can understand where you're coming from. And so that's why you have the following that you have, which I think is really, really cool. I also think it's why we've had so many successful teams and coaches here. And you talked about it earlier, whether it's a lunch or a quick phone call, you guys support each other and you're, you're inspiring that in your teams. And, that, and you mentioned before, you know, I don't get to work with students on a daily basis, but what I get to work with are 21 of the greatest coaches in the country, which is really inspiring to me. So how do I find those coaches to, to continue the legacy we have here is really inspirational. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate. Courtney's screwing up my 
am I recruiting now? Because I'm trying to work recruiting around her games. <laughs> so and if not, I got my phone and I'm sitting in the recruits home. I say, excuse well, me a minute. And I'll on. say, gosh, <sighs> rebound. You say rebound. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's great for you guys to, to be here and to, to share those things. And you're no whining. I was actually reading an article about another alum today, of Jim Delaney. Mm -hmm. And his mother taught him, no bullies, no victims. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to, mm -hmm. you just, you, you experience what you have and you just move on. I think one addition to that, I just want to make sure it get, gets said, is that we recruit to the institution. And so when they get here, we got to push them to the institution, right. right? They're so enjoyed because they're so talented and they're, what they do, their inspiration is so fun to watch. Um, and, you know, we, we tell them you can come here and you can major in whatever you want. You can be surrounded by all stars. You can be surrounded by road scholars and professional athletes. And then when they get here, as I told them, I push you out to go do that, you know? And so the success that we all have only makes the whole thing better, you know? And I think that's across that line. But you said it earlier, it's gotta be the right fit here. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if we don't bring in the proper fit, we're, we're not being fair to the person mm -hmm. because we're putting him or her in a very difficult situation because you need to wanna be here mm -hmm. and you need to fit here. And then like you said, as is uncut, we're encouraging our student athletes to separate from being the athlete mm -hmm. and be the person. And even our morning practices have done that so much because our guys now can be more involved in activities in the afternoon and they can be students at night and they can go to a movie and they can do things that traditionally football players haven't ever been able to do. And, and I think this place is very unique to that. Mm -hmm. It is, I hope it's not unique in college athletics though. You know, our mission here is we educate and inspire through athletics and you guys do an unbelievably good job of that. And what I've seen in the last few years is a movement toward professional athletics. And that concerns me because I want every one of your student athletes to go pro. I want them to play in the NFL. I want to play in the WNBA. I want them to play in the professional leagues. I want to play in the Olympics, the World Cup. But I also want them to get a great educational experience. And, and we keep doing things that push us towards pro, which I, I don't believe in, because what we just heard today, that's the growth that intercollegiate athletics provides. That's the educational environment that is so meaningful for the rest of your life. And so I think we need, we have a collective responsibility to get that message out and to have people really appreciate what, what is done in the university environment. Because there's, to a person, I guarantee you, you've had multiple players that have played in the NFL, maybe won Super Bowls that come back and said, my best experience was in college. Absolutely. My best experience For was sure. in that locker room when I was developing and growing. And we need to make sure we continue that. Yeah, Bubba, I want to tee off on that because what's happening right now, because we do recruit these kids that are so young, <clears throat> we've got three kids committed in the 2023 class. They're the three of the best kids in the country. And here's what's happening. These kids are so extraordinary. U.S. soccer is sending their emissaries in, their national youth team coaches, to try to c convince this kid to sign a pro contract and not go to college. And the reason for that is the European model is to sign them all as fast as you can. That's the European model. The people that are advising our player development at the highest level in this country are basically Dutch or Europeans. And so they're coming in, they're trying to tell us, you know, how we should be developing our kids. And yet, the United States in women's soccer is dynastic. We have won more world championships than any country in the world. I think they should study our model. Our model is what you're talking about. Our model is developing the human being while you're developing the athlete. And so for me, uh, I am looking at these kids that did sign pro or left early and I'm judging them against our kids. And you know what? Our kids have a much better experience for all the reasons you just shared. And it's, it is the education. It is the environment. It is all these different things. But we're not sacrificing their player development because the two go hand in hand. The human development goes right alongside the player development. And uh, for me, I love what you're saying because we've got to sell that narrative because that's the correct narrative. We, in my I'm opinion. sorry, but, but a lot of times we sell 40 years, not four. Yeah. Because we're preparing them for life after sport. For sure. At some point, our legs die. And all you can do is dance. All you can at do that is point. dance. Yeah, well, <laughs> dancing of the Stars is called, but I assure you I'm not going to answer it. So I'm not going to do that. But, uh, but, but when we do say 40 years instead of four, we actually mean it. And, and that's the other thing. The experiences that our, our students get, they can't get any other place than in this environment. 
and, and I think that's the, that's the pay they really get. And, um, but for a student-run organization, you'd also say that, therefore, part of that, f you came here for 40, so make sure you're preparing yourself for 40 while you're here. Yeah, with you your know, four. Which is not just coming to practice, getting your practice plan, getting your room key, you know, and uh, going eligible. to, yeah, yeah, that's just not, that you're not preparing yeah. yourself for 40 in the same way. Um, yeah, be passionate, don't just participate. Mm -hmm. Another quote I've heard along the way that I really like is, use the sport don't let the sport use you. Yeah. And you know, it, I really believe in that. We're yeah. providing these opportunities, but you have to take advantage of it. It's not easy. We ask an awful lot, but boy, the more you invest, the more you get out. 100%. One of my favorite stories of all time is a football story. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I share this constantly in, in coaching clinics. Amos Alonzo Stagg was the coach at the University of Chicago, I guess before they, they banned football. And his team had just won a national championship. And this reporter walks up to him right after the game and said, hey, coach, uh, what do you think of your team? And his answer, I think, is the greatest answer any coach could give in that circumstance. And he said, uh, I'll tell you in 20 years. Yeah. So what he understood is the ephemeral value of the victory was meaningless compared to basically the life lessons you can learn through athletics and being a part of a team and being a teammate in the most positive way. And for me, that just resonates. Now, <clears throat> of course, I can't say that because I'll be dead in 20 years. <laughs> but uh, I loved it, you know, during that stretch when I could say that and still be alive. Um, but I just think that is the perfect thing to say because then you understand uh, where athletics has value, not in raising a championship trophy. It's in all the elements that go in to constructing that and watching these young men or young women live their lives. And we've seen not all of our best teams had our best players. It had the best people that worked together. And it's so interesting to do, because we've all been around long enough, exactly what you said, and that's look at your team 20 years later. They're close. They care about each other, our, our, our bowl game, our our early teams here that were not good and became good, the Peach Bowl group, they were all there. They're all in a suite together, which was probably pretty dangerous. I'm glad I wasn't up there <laughs> to monitor it, but, uh, but they stayed close because it meant something to them and they, they, they accomplished things together. And, and so it is a 40 year decision. Mm -hmm. And Courtney, you talked about it early. You, you seem to be more inspired when you play for someone other than yourself. Yeah. You're playing for a person, a cause, a team a coach, something beyond yourself yeah. is an intrinsic motivation you don't get just for the own glory of your own success. Yeah, I say the same thing about you know fundraising. You're not giving to a person, you're giving to a thing. You're giving to a living, moving amoeba that you support, right? And um, yeah, getting, this, getting, getting your team to understand that you go further together, um, but yet don't, get, don't lose the parts in the whole, but don't let the whole lose the parts. Right, so each, I have one part in my team and I'm obligated to do a good job, as is everybody else. And the whole is what matters. So I actually coach the team, I coach 14 individuals to become better, better, better. And I, all I emphasize is team, right? So it's a really unique dynamic. I think one of the hardest dynamics we have in college athletics, I'll say, is you're challenged every day to push people beyond their comfortable limits. That's very uncomfortable but you're judged by your boss, a positive student athlete experience. Those two things are incredible, those are dichotomies, right? And so you walk that line minute to minute and you've really made it when you've walked that line minute to minute where now the growth process is so transformational, they buy into the heart of it, right? And even if you can do that with your leaders and the younger guys get brought along and then they, they shift into that. Um, and that's what's great about being at a high academic institution because technically they're, they're getting pulled. Or we're not the only two hours of the day, three hours of the day where they're getting pushed. I don't want you three to think pushing players is the only people you're pushing. You're pushing me every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely fantastic. You're it coachable. Is you are coachable. That's good. <laughs> beginning of the year we talked about it as a staff my word for the year was gratitude and I want to express my gratitude to, to all of you not just for today but what you do year-round so thank you very much mm -hmm.